Welcome to the experiment portion for the formation of cyclohexene. In the lab, we're going to start by taking our 25 milliliter round bonding flask and adding one of the starting materials, cyclohexanol. Cyclohexanol is a liquid at room temperature. You can actually see some solid on the lid there. It actually uh, has a melting point very close to room temperature, so if it's a little bit cool, sometimes that can be a solid. Based on the table of re reagents that we talked about before, we need to add about five grams of cyclohexanol. We're going a little bit slow to make sure that the scale equilibrates from what we're adding. Looking at the scale, we've added 5.03 grams of cyclohexanol. Again, 5.03 grams. Next, we need to add our acid catalyst, amberlist 15. Again, based on our calculations that we looked at before, we need to add about 0.13 grams. We zeroed the Weibo, or taking the spatula, the spatula, and adding that into the Weibo. It's always good to go slow because it's easier to <clears throat> add a little bit more into the Weibo rather than trying to get it from the Weibo and put it back in the original container. Also, that would lead to contamination of that. So really what you should do is probably take it from the Weibo and put it in the solid waste container, which is wasteful. All right, so we do have 0.13 grams of our Amberlis 15. And now we need to add our Amberlis 15 to the round bottom flask from that way boat. That Amberlis 15 has a static interaction with that way boat, so it's important to scrape it. You could also use a static electricity gun to minimize that interaction and I'll allow all those um, essentially beads of Amberlis 15 to drop down into the round bottom flask. And notice that um, all of the Amberlis 15 is down inside the round bottom flask. Nothing is stuck to the neck of the round bottom flask. Now we're getting one boiling chip, putting it in the round bottom flask so that our liquid, mostly cyclohexanol, doesn't bump or essentially have a a small explosion within the round bottom flask and I'll shoot over into the collection flask which essentially defeats the perfect purpose of doing a simple distillation. So the power mites connected we're gonna put that at about 30 to 40 percent um, as it starts again to make sure that it doesn't bump and we don't um, push the reaction a little bit too quick. So with our simple distillation apparatus, you can see water going in the bottom of the condenser, out the top. We've got the head of the thermometer down below the exit of the three-way adapter. We can see inside that round bottom flask our Amberlis 15 and our cyclohexanol. And now it's starting to distill. So now we can see that our um, what is cyclohexene is now, which has a lower boiling point than cyclohexanol, is up into our three-way adapter and it is being condensed within our condenser and that liquid is falling down and is about to be collected in our collection flask, which is actually just a small test tube. And you can see that we've started collecting quite a bit of cyclohexene in our test tube. And again, since cyclohexene has a lower boiling point than cyclohexanol or our byproduct water, that is what's being collected in the condenser. We can monitor this reaction make sure it doesn't get to 100 or above, meaning that we're not collecting water and or starting material by keeping that temperature down around 80 degrees Celsius. So we're still collecting drop by drop. The temperature is a little bit higher now. So we're going to turn down that 
that variac to regulate the temperature of that thermo well. And we'll see if we keep collecting. If we stop collecting, that means maybe the reaction's done. If we continue to collect at a lower temperature, that means we can increase our percent recovery. You see everything is slowing down quite a bit. We don't have as much potential product that can come over at this point. It's hard to see in there, but we have about a milliliter left, so about 80% um, has come over. Okay, now we've taken the heater off. You can see what's left in that round bottom flask. Again, about a milliliter of the original, approximately five milliliters of starting material is left. And that's just cooling down for a second. What we're focused on, though, is what we collected in that test tube. So we're using drying agent, potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate is somewhat, somewhat basic, which will neutralize any acidity for our isolated cyclohexene. And it is also a drying reagent. So essentially, it is going to have strong interactions with water and solidify around the water that it's interacting with, allowing us to decant our product, which will not have any water byproduct in it once we decant it out of that test tube. So right now we've added potassium carbonate. We're swirling it around to make sure there's no potassium carbonate that's loosely floating around in that test tube. If there is, that means there's no more water for it to interact with if there isn't any more water, then when we shake that, you can essentially see the solid particles moving around very easily. So that's basically to the point where we are right now. You can see those solid particles moving around pretty easily in that test tube as we move it around. Which means we're at the point where we can decant our pure cyclohexene into something else, ideally pre-weighed or zeroed, and then we can assess the weight of the product that we isolated. We ended up with 2.69 grams of our product. So that is our experimental yield is 2.69 grams of product. At this point in the experiment, we're going to add 0.1 molar bromine dissolved in the solvent dichloromethane. We're going to add five drops to each of the test tubes. This is our reagent. And then from here, we're going to add the starting material, cyclohexanol, to the first test tube. And you can see now we are adding a drop into the test tube. And you can see it run down the side of the test tube. And it will touch that solution in just a minute. And notice as it touches the solution, there is no color change in the solution. So we're going to swirl it around for a second, see if anything happens. It looks like it's slightly more dilute than it was, a very mild cha color change, possibly some radical reactions um, caused a little bit of the bromine to um, no longer be visible. But overall, definitely we still have some bromine solution. For the second one, now that we add our um, cyclohexene, our product, now it's totally colorless. So you can see that bromine fully reacted and now we have dibromocyclohexane rather than cyclohexene. And then one more visualization to see that the test tube on the right, no more Br2 is present. The test tube on the left, we still have Br2 in solution.